Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're tuning in from somewhere else, welcome to somewhere else. <laughs> That's still funny to just like two people in the room. But <laughs> I got to get a new one. I just haven't had time to think about it. A while back, I told you guys a story about a man by himself out on a walk through the woods. He was on a path. And eventually, that path, I'm afraid of heights, so this is as close as I'm going to get, goes along a cliffside. Sure enough, he slips off. He falls a long way down. Finally, he finds a branch to grab onto, and he's holding on for dear life. So in desperation, he calls out, Help! Is there anyone up there? Yes, he hears a voice. Oh, okay, help me. The voice says, let go. I says, who is that? It's God. Let go. Man says, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> Today, I'm going to tell you the rest of that story. So the man's hanging on for a while, and he cries out again, anyone else? Finally, yes. Yes, there's someone else up there. Two people, bandits, two robbers. Now, it's going to sound similar to a movie, but it's not. <laughs> Some people will know where I'm going. But anyway, they say, we'll help you. We're going to throw down a rope, long rope. He's a long way down. You can climb up. OK, just one thing. Don't look down. Now, this seemed normal to the man, right? When we're in a high place, especially if you're like me, you're a little afraid of heights. You look down, you get a little dizzy sometimes. And don't look down. All right. They want him to come up because they're going to rob him. And they know by the time he climbs this rope, he's going to be really, really tired. Also, he didn't offload some of his stuff. He's got the backpack on. It's full of all kinds of stuff. So he's climbing up the rope now. The thieves are just waiting. Finally, he gets to the top. He's totally exhausted. He's done. Sure enough, they rob him and kill him. Now, while they're looting the body, they're taking all the stuff out of the pockets, the backpack, everywhere, they said to each other, it's a good thing he didn't look down. Because if he had listened to God and let go, he would have landed safely on the ground just a few feet beneath him. Last week, we talked about promises. This week, we'll talk about kind of the opposite. We looked at the adult life of Isaac, Abraham's son. We saw the getting a bride for Isaac account. Maybe Eliezer, the servant, went and got Rebekah for him. We also saw that he was deceitful with Abimelech, like father, like son. We saw that he made an oath with him. That place was named Beersheba, well of the oath. We did a bunch of skipping around. 
And I told you we're going to do that a lot in this series. So if you're following along, I'll try to tell you where we are. Because we're keeping it topical. The storyline doesn't always go like perfectly and chronologically or attaching ideas to one another, kind of like a movie does. Right? It'll kind of do cut scenes. It'll cut away to something else that might be happening at the same time or at a different time. So I'm putting it back together again and doing it topically. This will be really interesting when we get to the prophets, because they all go kind of back in to the rest of the story that happened before. So this is what we're doing if you're new and you're wondering how I'm going about this. So let's go back. We did Genesis 24 and 26 last week. So let's hop into 25. We just went there for a brief moment. And I want to look at the accounts of Isaac's sons. Genesis 25, 19. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife, Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paden Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. So we're going to talk about him a little more today, too. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord heard his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children inside her struggled with each other, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So this is Jacob and Esau. So first... Esau comes out, and it says, he's red and hairy, really hairy. So his name means hairy, Esau, or sounds like hairy. We'll get there. Jacob comes out, and he's grabbing Esau's heel. So his name sounds like deceiver and heel. We saw these combination names. They all kind of mean something. They do become two nations that have a history with one another. They'll develop it, and we'll see this later in the rest of the story. We can elaborate a little bit at Bible study, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Here are two reasons why. Esau grows up, and he becomes a skillful hunter. And Isaac likes this, his dad, because he gets a lot of wild game, and they make stews. He really enjoys that. But it says that Rebecca likes Jacob, and he's kind of a homebody. So one day, Jacob is making stew. Esau comes in. He smells it. <laughs> He's hungry. He says, I'm starving. Give me some of that red stew. And this is important because it says that this is where he gets his other name, Edom. So whenever you hear about the Edomites, this is where it comes from. And that's this history. If you're familiar with Obadiah, that's kind of what that's all about. Edomites don't gloat over what's happening to Israel. So this sets us up for that. Give me some of that stew. I'm starving. Now Jacob begins to earn his namesake. He says, oh, I'll give you some of the stew if you sell me your birthright, your inheritance. Hmm. Esau thinks about it for a minute and says, well, what good will my inheritance do me if I starve to death? <laughs> Maybe there's some hyperbole there. I don't know. But he makes a bad decision and does it. He eats the stew. As we continue reading, we see that Isaac is now getting old. And what he wants to do is bless his oldest son before he dies. So he tells Esau, take a quiver of arrows and your bow and go out there and hunt me some of that wild game and make me a, a nice stew. And then I'll bless you. Okay. So he goes out and does it. Rebecca hears it. She reminds you of Sarah. She's eavesdropping. She likes Jacob. She wants him to have the blessing, not Esau. So she gets Jacob and she says, go out and get a couple goats for me. Bring it back in. I'll cook them up. Serve it to your father. You get the blessing. How is this possible? Well, Isaac is going blind. He's really old. He can't see. Okay, but Jacob's like, ah, I don't know. My, my brother, he's hairy and I have smooth skin. Not like my brother. So if he touches me, he's going to know. He says, don't worry about it. Just do what I say. If he curses you, let that curse fall on me instead. Okay, so he gets the goats. She comes up with a plan. She gets some of Esau's favorite clothes and puts them on him. So he's going to smell like them. Then she takes the skin of the animals and puts them on his arms and his neck, probably where Isaac will touch him. Cooks up the stew. Now he goes in, Jacob the deceiver. Ah, is that Esau? You're back quick. Well, 
God put it in my path. It was easy. Here's your stew. Sure, you're Esau. Yeah, come here. He touch you, and sure enough, it works. He feels hairy. But he says, hmm, the hands, they're Esau's, but the voice is Jacob's. Are you sure? Yes, I'm Esau. Okay, he eats the stew and then gets his brother's blessing. Right as he's finishing up, in comes Esau. He says, I'm here. Cooks up the stew. His dad's like, I already gave you your blessing. And he realizes Jacob stole it. Esau's really upset now. It says this, Genesis 27, 36. So he said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me twice now. He took my birthright and look, now he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you saved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. Then his father Isaac answered him, look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. So he's doing the opposite of what he told Jacob. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you rebel, you will break his yoke from your neck. So we see it first, Esau has contempt for his birthright, sells it for a bowl of stew. And Jacob steals his blessing. Esau vows revenge. I'm going to kill him. He's really upset. And we'll see that in the future, there will indeed be some strife between the two nations that they become. In Genesis 36, something kind of important happens that a lot of people miss. Esau takes a spite bride. <laughs> he goes and he marries Ishmael's daughter. Now, if you're following along and you remember who was Ishmael, that was Abraham's other son by the slave wife that got sent away. It's also the reason that they're sending their sons away. They don't want them to marry the local women, the Hittites, the Canaanites, those people. They want to keep it with their own kinsmen. So Esau knows this. Knows his parents aren't going to be happy, so he takes one of those women as his bride. So now you have these two peoples, right, that are going to be at odds coming together. So it's important. But it's also important because Rachel, who's also been deceptive, uses that very same reasoning to get Isaac to send Jacob away. Very interesting. She says, I won't have my son marrying one of these Hittite or Canaanite women. It's important. Isaac, he can still hear, and so he says, yeah, good idea. Let's send him away so he doesn't marry any of these Canaanite women. So same reasoning that the servant was sent to get Rebecca, if you remember from last week. So Jacob goes. He flees to Paden Aram, where Laban is. On the way there, you guys probably remember this story. He takes a nap on a rock. Doesn't sound very comfortable, but he has a vision and he sees angels coming up and down like the stairway, or some people say ladder. God's at the top, and God gives him a great blessing, like the one that he gave to his father and his grandfather. Except this time, it's not like stars in the sky. Your descendants will be like stars in the sky. It says dust of the ground. Still many. Imagine grains of sand. There are many. You can't count them. Blesses him, and so he decides to call this place Bethel house of God. Surely God is here. And then he uses the stone he napped on. It's just like a commemorative marker. Bethel's an important place. Finally, Jacob arrives at Paden Aram. He comes across a well and some people there. He asks about Laban. Do you know Laban? Yes, we do. And you know what? There's his daughter, Rachel, coming our way. Now we have another well scene. Do you remember what happened? at the last well. You had Eliezer, the servant, maybe him, and Rebecca. Well, here something different happens. In this account, Jacob, the groom, is actually there. He's at the scene, unlike the servant. And this time, he waters the flocks for her. It was the woman the other time, so it's reversed this time. Well, she's excited, finds out he's kin, this time first cousins, not second cousins, like his mom and dad. And so she runs and tells Laban. Laban gets excited, comes out, and sees him. 
this is great. Now, Jacob ends up working for him for about a month. About a month by. And he says something that's kind of out of character for Laban. But we'll see where he's going with this. He said, you know, just because you're my kinsman, you shouldn't be working for free. What do you want as your wages? Well, Jacob says, give me your daughter, Rachel. He says, okay, work for seven years. And I'll give her to you. So it says, it went by like a few days because of his love for Rachel. So they get to the time of the wedding feast. And here's the thing. <laughs> he has two daughters, Leah, and it says some not so nice things about her. She's not pretty, I'll put it that way. And Rachel, who it says, she has a nice figure. She's very pretty. Well, when it gets dark, maybe, Jacob drank a lot at the wedding feast. It just says, it gets dark, speculating. Laban puts Leah in the tent, not Rachel. He wakes up. What did you do? I can't believe this. Laban's kind of casual about it. It's kind of a surprising response. Well, it's not our custom here to give away the younger daughter before the older daughter. Every time I read that, I laugh because I think, you had seven years to tell me that. Like, that's like the fine print. You know what I mean? Like, he's holding on to that the whole time, right? He doesn't see them flirting with each other or anything. Not, nothing. <clears throat> I'm going to get him. All right. But I'll give you, Rachel, if you work another seven years. But here's the thing. After the wedding feast week, they would, they would feast for a week at a wedding. After that's over, you can marry Rachel, too. So he gets her, like, ahead of time, I guess, part of the deal. So he's like, okay, fine. And this is what it says, Genesis 29, 20. And Jacob did just that. He finished the week of celebration, and Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. And Laban gave his slave Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her slave. Jacob slept with Rachel also, and indeed, he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. So now we have something that everybody skips over, but it's kind of important when you start reading the rest of the story to understand why the relationships between these people are the way they are. So I'll drop into some kind of series my wife is watching, and I don't know what is going on. Well, that person did, like, why did he do that? Well, you know, this relative of this family member killed somebody or whatever and did this and that, so now he's getting revenge. I don't know any of it. And so in order to understand some of these relationships, understanding these genealogies are very, very important. And they can be arduous. They can be difficult to read, but I'm just going to encourage you to go through them. So here's what happens. It says that God has some favor on Leah or feels sorry for her because he knows that Jacob likes Rachel, right? So she's blessed with children first. So you have the oldest child, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Judah is the line from which Jesus comes from. Well, Rachel gets antsy. She's upset. She's not having children. So... She gives Jacob her slave or servant, Bilhah, to be with. Does this sound familiar to you? Remember Sarah and Hagar. So he's with Bilhah. That's fine. Dan, Naphtali come from Bilhah. Well, then Leah's not getting pregnant. This is problematic for her. She has a slave, Zilpah. And now she has Gad and Asher. Well, then we get a kind of funny story about Mandrakes. Who knows what a mandrake is? Amazing. You're a liar. You watch Harry Potter. <laughs> mandrake. I didn't either, so don't feel bad. I didn't either until I was preparing for this message. It's one of those things I just kind of read by when I read my Bible or I'm listening to it. I'm like, whatever. I guess it's a tasty treat. Here's what happens. Reuben, the oldest son, gets mandrakes and gives them to Leah, his mother. I know, it's difficult. Are you following? <laughs> All right, so the one that he doesn't love. Rachel wants the mandrakes. So she says, give me some of them. Now Leah responds harshly. Ah, first you steal my son, now you are my husband, now you want my son's mandrakes too? That's the conversation. So she says, you know what? I'll give you Jacob. 
if I can have some of those mandrakes. Now that alone by itself might sound surprising. Like, what? But if you remember the other stories, you have Esau selling his birthright for red stew. So whatever, I guess in this storyline, it seems kind of normal. I started thinking, what's a mandrake? <laughs> I found out. I thought it was like a fruit or something like that. I said, well, it must be a really tasty fruit. Let me get some of that because you're going to sell your spouse for it. It's got to be pretty good. But <laughs> you're know, like, let's try it. <laughs> but it turns out that a mandrake is like a root. In the ancient world, it has properties, or they believed it had properties that would make you more fertile. Ah, Rachel's not having kids. So here's another example of someone trying to press forward on a human effort to make these births happen. Really interesting. I didn't know that that was underneath there. So I just learned it. Now you know. You can sound smart at a Bible study or something like that. But here's the thing. You've got to remember, this is an important theme that we're going to see. It's all throughout the Bible. It says that before having Joseph now, Rachel prays. Very important. This wasn't done on her own initiative. God did it. God caused Joseph to happen. And Joseph's going to be really important. If you're paying attention, I'll give you a little hint here. I normally like to leave this stuff and let you guys find the Easter eggs. But really important when we go over the Joseph account. Remember who Rachel is. It's the bride he wanted first. He got kind of like cheated out of it for the seven years. It's the one he loves. Right? There's strife between the two brides. And now it's finally one of her own children, not through the servant. You could have children back then through your servant wife, right? Because you own the servant. Anything they do becomes your property. That's how that works. But it's important. Joseph is really, really important. I'll tell you another one in a minute. We'll go, keep going through the story here. Well, Jacob wants to leave. He gets to a point where he wants to go. And Laban, in the background, when you put it all together, he doesn't want him to go. All right? Jacob is a good shepherd, and he's making Laban a lot of money. Laban's really happy. He wants to leave, and he says, what should your wages be? Jacob's like, not another bride. I don't to do that again, right? It'll cost me another seven years and more trouble and mandrakes or whatever. I'm done hearing about it, right? So he says, give me the speckled, spotted, or you know, the black sheep of the flock. Give me them. That's it. Now, I read up on it because I know nothing about farming at all. And I'm wondering why he does this. Well, it's a small percentage of the flock. It's said that maybe like 20% of the flock is going to be like this. So he knows he's going to get it. It's a good deal for Laban. Laban says, okay. But then Laban now, again, deceives the deceiver. He goes and he removes those sheep from his flock, gives them to his sons, and puts them out about a three-day journey. Nice. So what does Jacob do? No problem. So he's tending to his uncle, Laban's flock, and he does another kind of ancient thing that is weird. If you've ever read this account, he takes bark strips and he puts them in the water. And then when the sheep mate in front of it, they come out, the babies come out speckled, spotted. I don't know. This made me go, what? You know what I mean? So it's like one of those things, like, be careful what TV show is on when you guys are consummating your thing there, you know? Because what could your children, ooh, let's watch Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, right? And then the kids will be really handsome. So I wondered about this, like what you look at and then your child comes out like that, how does this work? Apparently in the ancient world, they believed that. But it's like the mandrake. Probably not. Now like all the holistic people are like, no, it works. So <laughs> I don't know, okay? So I'm not a scientist or a doctor. Anyway, they believed this. And so that's what's going on here. It's important to pay attention though to what happens. He's clever. He mates only the stronger sheep. So on some of his own initiative, it works out. He becomes very, very wealthy. The flocks increase greatly. And then he decides he's going to leave. Why? Here's what it says. Genesis 31.1. Now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built his wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him was not the same. Then the Lord said to him, go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Okay, but here's what happens. He consults with Rachel and Leah, and they say, fine, we want to get out of here. Our dad has squandered our inheritance anyway, so we're out. But that's not enough. 
Rachel decides to steal from her father, his idols. I'll explain this to you. If you haven't read the Bible, you don't understand it. It's okay. Sometimes idols can be like statues that people worship, false gods, idols. Right? So when we talk about idols in the church, what are your idols? Meaning, what are the things that you're worshiping? What are the things you're, you're putting ahead of God? And that's what they are. But at this time, they're like little figurines they can be. Maybe he carved them out of wood. The Bible talks a lot about that kind of stuff. And she decides to steal them. Hmm. And they take off. They get about three days out. See a theme here? Laban notices. It takes Laban about seven days to catch up with him. When he does, he's really upset. Like, what did you do? How could you take off like this? If you had told me, I would have thrown you a celebration. It would have been great. Well, there's nothing in Laban's character to suggest that this would have happened this way. So Jacob starts leveling back at him. It's this big argument. Then Laban gets to another problem. And you know what? You're a thief, Jacob. You've stolen my idols. Jacob's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Search everywhere. If you find whoever did it, kill him. So he does. He searches his daughters and their servants' tents and doesn't come up with anything because they are in Rachel's saddle, either under the saddle or within it. So Laban gets to Rachel, or Rebecca, Rachel, Rachel, sorry. It gets very confusing. Rachel's saddle, thought I said it wrong. <clears throat> gets up to her and she says, excuse me, sir, it's my time of the month. He says, okay, I'm out. So he doesn't check for the idols. So she steals the idols. She deceives him. Then <laughs> we see an interaction with Jacob and Esau finally. It's been about 20 years. It's been a long time. But Jacob's a little nervous about it. He's thinking, mm, is he going to kill me now? I could be in trouble. So what he does is he sends gifts and waves ahead of him. It ends up working out. They get along. He doesn't decide to take revenge. If we fast forward a little bit, Rachel, she dies, like everybody does. But she dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. She's really sad. So at first she names him as she's dying with her dying breath, Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob renames him Benjamin. Now remember, I'm going to give you, give you a couple of Easter eggs here. Two kids, Rachel has Joseph and Benjamin. A couple weeks from now, that's going to be very important. They're very important players in the story. And this will give you the motivation as to why Jacob does some of the things that he does. Later, Isaac dies. And we see another interaction with Jacob and Esau. And it's friendly. They bury his father. It says this, 3528 of Genesis, Isaac lived 180 years, did five years better than his dad, he took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So regardless of the deceit, we don't see any revenge yet. We'll talk about that later in the rest of the story. Maybe Esau thinks it's a dish better served cold. Come on, let's do guys. You're killing me. Okay. Now, you may know that it's not just Abraham who had the name changed. Do you remember that? He went from Abram to Abraham, exalted father to father of multitudes to father of many. While Jacob was waiting for Esau, he's afraid. It's nighttime. He's a little scared. And something happens. A man shows up and wrestles with him overnight. A man. Kind of interesting. He dislocates Jacob's hip socket. But regardless of that, he won't let go. He's holding on very tight. It says this, Genesis 32, 26. And the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This guy likes his blessings. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. 
Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face. Now, we know if we read the Bible in its entirety, for example, Hosea, I believe chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, tells us that this is an angel from God. It's God himself and that Jacob had wrestled or struggled with God. So it's interesting to think. Jacob, he goes on to being, from being the deceiver to the one who wrestles or holds on to God. That is the origin of the name. Israel struggles with God or holds on to God or wrestles with God. Remember how Jacob grabbed on to Esau's heel. He started his life that way. Jacob is grabbing on to things. Even if he has to use deceit to get it, he's holding on to all the things of the world. You see what's going on here. He starts out that way, whether it's the inheritance, all the stuff, the livestock. He's holding on to a lot. But now, he's Israel. He's holding on to God. The rest of the story here that a lot of people don't cover is very important. When he sends the gifts on ahead, something interesting happens. You gotta think about it. I told you it's about 20 years, right? So he has all these herds. It's a lot of stuff. It's like a small, moving a small village or town around with him. A lot of stuff. 20 years of wealth he's got with him. He lets go of it. Genesis 32, 21. So the gifts this is for Esau were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent that night in the camp. During the night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. He's there with no one and nothing when he holds on to God. And God gave him a new name. The world. That's a lot of names for us, doesn't it? Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. But God has given us a new identity in him. Like Jacob, if we hold on to him. Have you ever lived life in deceit? Have you ever deceived anyone? Has anyone ever deceived you? In what ways might the world be deceiving us? You see, the world tells us a lot of lies. But, as I've told you, the Word does not. New people come here, and sometimes they say something like, that was refreshing. You preached the Bible. Others go, that was a lot of scriptures. And I don't say, see you next week. <laughs> we preach from the Word here for a reason, because it does not lie to us. It is the truth. The minute I start giving too many of my opinions, I get it wrong. One degree of separation down the line, way off. So I always come back to the word. I paraphrase, I'll tell you the stories, but what am I doing? It comes back to the word. It's always verified in the word. I will never tell you anything that you can't find, and by the way, probably redundantly, in the word of God. We shouldn't be deceived by the lies of this world. We shouldn't cling to them either. Some of us like them. Sometimes we cling to those lies. We shouldn't cling to them. Even if they seem good, even if they seem like they're getting us somewhere, this promise will be fulfilled eventually. It seems good sometimes. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's not a climb. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we think we're climbing the rope, the ladder to success. Here's the thing. In reality, the, wor the world is always out to deceive us. 
we find our real hope in clinging to God. And God alone. The world is shouting, shouting lies to us. Climb that ladder to success. Believe this or that. Be angry about this and that. Hate this person or that person. Constantly. But where's Christ in that? We mustn't confuse one ladder with the other ladder. The real goal is in heaven. You see, the world tells us this is it. This is all that there is for you. It has all there is to offer. But the word says something different. Set your minds on what is above. Not, not on what is on the earth. The world says this is our permanent home and our final resting place. But the word says, but our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15. The world will also tell you there's something wrong with you. That you need what it has to offer because God is not enough. They will tell you not to trust in God's provision. Don't let go. It's whatever it is you're holding on to. Don't look down. Take this rope. Hang yourself with it. But we need to let go and let God trust in his provisions. We must learn that from the word. You see, whatever Jacob thought he was doing to increase his wealth, the bark strips, Rachel's mandrakes. The growth was caused by God. God tells Jacob this. And if you know this, if you're listening today and you refuse the rope or whatever it is, the world will do something different. It'll try to get you to identify with it. it tricks you. You belong here because you're one of them. And we have all kinds of different groups we can join and say, I'm a this, I'm a that. Instead of just saying, I'm a Christian. I don't know about any of those other things. Who cares? My eyes are focused on Jesus Christ and the hope of the riches in his glory. What else matters? The world is telling you, what's this child of God stuff? What's this children of the promise thing you're talking about? Come on. The world also tells you, you'll never change. But the word says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and look, look, new things have come. The world loves to remind you of your mistakes. It sells them back to you all the time and we buy it loves to remind you you've deceived someone, you've lied in the past, you slipped and fell off that cliff, and now you need the world's help somehow. You fail. The word says, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the truth, not the world. The world tells you you're nothing special, but the word says, I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know this very well. The world tells you you're worthless, but the word says you're worth it. 1 John 4, 9, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 
We must not hold on to the world, its lies and its false promises, its deceit. Instead, we must hold on to the word, the word of life. Running short on time, so I won't recite the whole thing. But in the past, I've recited the Carmen Christi gospel poem, Philippians 2. It's beautiful. It tells us about the nature, the character of Jesus Christ, who he is. He's God. What he did for us, he was obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that every knee will bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Paul's writing by the power of the Holy Spirit, these beautiful, beautiful words. And then he says this, Philippians 2.16, Hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor, labor for nothing. You see, Paul knows how we finish this race strong. And he wants them to finish the race strong. He knows we do this by holding firmly to the word of life. As I close this morning, I'm just going to take a step back. I'm going to let the word of God speak to you. I want to read you what it says about the world versus the word. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1. we proclaim to you that the one who existed from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus, whom we have heard and seen, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Then he moves on. He's worried about false teachers, liars, people of the world. It's always a bad thing. Versus you, God's children. 1 John 2.14, I have written to you, who are God's children, because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you're strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. That's a promise you should hold on to. 1 John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. The word tells us how we achieve victory. 1 John 5, starting at verse 4, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We must hold firmly to those promises. We must hold firmly to the word of life. Not to the things of this world, but to God. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this day, for these people, your body, the body of Christ, your church. If there's anyone who's not yet made that commitment and said that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, work on their heart, realize that the world is lying to them that they should accept the truth in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. And I pray that those who have received the promises, the blessings, that who are children of God, that you strengthen them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Build them up so that they radiate out to the community a love to their neighbors, 
so that more people come to know you. All glory and honor to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.